Thank you very much, Raymond. Thank you very much. Salam pagi. Good morning to everyone. Thank you for the opportunity given to uh, MV International to collaborate with this uh, uh, technologies uh, in digital conference uh, uh, for this time. And also, I'd like to thanks to participants who take time and uh, be in this uh, uh, digital forum. Uh, furthermore, I would like to introduce our, uh, our great uh, technologies. Uh, Mahaji Abi Sofia Abdul Hamid uh, is uh, a brief about his, and he's a group MD called Partner Group Consulting, and he is also a member International Management Committee, the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport (CILT). He also a Secretary General CILT Malaysia was 2017 and 2019, and he also a former GMD Group. In the director NCB Holding Berhad was in 2014 to 2016, and also former CEO Not Pop Malaysia Berhad in 20, 2012 and 2014. And he's also a very great uh, uh, author for our conference, was uh, previously is, uh, editing a lot of uh, our conference and also uh, giving a lot of thoughts on the conference uh, for the supply chain. It also uh, is called uh, like a, a, a guru for uh, in logistic and uh, transport. And uh, furthermore, I leave it to Dr. Tuanji Abi to take over from here. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you, uh, Jivan. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and very good morning to everyone. And uh, welcome to a uh, webinar on how COVID-19 will change supply chains for good so this is a, a great challenge indeed you know not only to uh, supply chains uh, that will change but it's uh, for good so first of all i would like to uh, thank uh, help university and mp international for organizing this webinar session and also i'll find it um, very interesting in the midst of uh, some of the uh, mro restrictions being lifted off now. Thank you to all the esteemed speakers. Uh, they are uh, well-known experts in the industry, especially this uh, logistics industry. So we have today from the maritime sector, uh, Professor Nazri, Ajahn Professor Nazri from uh, UNT, University of Malaysia, Tengganu. We have Encik Muhammad Faiz Hakim, he is uh, the practitioner. Uh, he is the deputy CEO of uh, Asian Global Logistic, uh, Transport Logistics, Sudan Berhad. And uh, also we have our very own, or, or HAP's very own Professor Dr. Marco Timon. I think these are the, uh, what you call these um, people with uh, in-depth knowledge or, or inside knowledge of the industry. So I do hope you, everyone here today will uh, get the benefits intended uh, to, to, to be shared today. So, and uh, you guys will enjoy the food for thought, so to speak, served by the speakers today. So, uh, as uh, mentioned by um, the introducer earlier, uh, please use the chat room and the Q&A area as uh, you, you need, you know, to, to frame up the question. And uh, perhaps you can also indicate who is the speaker that you would like to uh, respond to your question. So <coughs> the agenda for today is that um, I'll just uh, mention briefly about this uh, uh, webinar today. Then we'll have uh, Mr. Faiz Hakim to present uh, his um, knowledge, his thought, his experience to share with us today. Uh, Encik Mama Faiz he's, um, has been in the industry for many, many years. And then we have our adjunct Professor Nazri from University of Malaysia, Tungganu. And then finally, uh, Professor Dr. Marco, uh, Marco for uh, this, uh, what I call the session. If I believe most of you who are in this industry would have known that uh, Professor Dr. Marco is one of these uh, expert on halal uh, industry, you know, in Malaysia. So 
finally we'll end up with a good <coughs> question and answer. So each speaker will present about 15 minutes uh, and then uh, uh, at the end of the session, we will have this question answered. So you, you are most welcome to uh, send in the, your questions uh, and things like that. So, okay, today, as I said, we go back to the uh, topic of today's uh, webinar. Now, how COVID-19 will change supply chains for good. So I think we all, uh, we are all aware uh, you know, after three months, what is uh, COVID-19 all about and to what extent the impact on our daily life. So some people may, may just see this as COVID as a form of disruptions. So can we call this as a mother of all disruptions? Of course, uh, people probably think about the negatives. But there are definitely a positive side, which uh, I hope we can learn more uh, on the positive side today. Then on the supply chain itself, you know, supply chains um, uh, made up of a few components. You have the uh, transport, you have the logistic, that means uh, uh, warehouses, and also the, the farm or the manufacturers, factories kind of thing. So what are the impacts? What are the changes? So let us uh, hear from the expert. How does COVID-19 affect supply chains? So I think without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Encik Muhammad Faiz Hakim to share his uh, view on this uh, COVID-19. Thank you. Uh, thank Over you, to you. Thank you, Dr. Javi. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you especially uh, to uh, HEP University uh, for organizing uh, and inviting me uh, to this ex esteemed event. Uh, thank you to MV International uh, for ru running uh, the show as well. Uh, my, uh, I, I'd like to extend uh, my <coughs> gratitude and privilege uh, to be lined up with all uh, the great people in the industry. Yeah? Uh, thank you very much. So, uh, Caroline, can, can we have my, my slide uh, ready? <coughs> can you bring me up to the, the, the first slide? You have to go back. Ah, okay. So, <coughs> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and uh, very good morning to everybody. All right. Uh, so I'm going to talk uh, basically about, about two things. I'm going to cover only two, uh, two areas. Number one is the new normal trend of global supply chain. Um, will, it, will it going to be there for good or, or not? Yeah. So this is what I, uh, I'm going to discuss. And uh, the second part of my uh, uh, presentation is going. Uh, I'm going to talk about how, as a company, uh, or at least my company, Asia Global Total Logistics, uh, to best position ourselves uh, to to face uh, this new normal in the global trend. Yeah. So the first slide, please, uh, Caroline. <coughs> okay, if you can see in, in this slide, um, they are actually sectors doing well. They are actually sectors doing well. Uh, if I, uh, I I took this. Um, uh, list from uh, Nasdaq 100. Um, Zoom is actually making a lot of money. Although we are we are we are uh, uh, conferencing on uh, Microsoft Team, but Zoom is actually uh, doing very well all over the world. Yeah? Uh, Tesla is a surprise a surprise list on this list, and you can see a lot of uh, pharmaceutical companies um, making good money. Uh, food food uh, companies. Um, and also the payment gateway, PayPal is on, uh, on board, Baidu is on board, and uh, not surprising, Amazon, because last month has been uh, making a lot of headway uh, locally, yeah? uh, not just in, in US, and you can see that it happening in Malaysia, not just uh, uh, the logistic last month, also the, the food on wheels, yeah? for crack food, uh, like the uh, food panda, and all the stuff. Yeah? Next slide, please. <clears throat> so, um, 
they are, however, companies are really, really badly affected. Number one is tourism and travel. I mean, it's just like stand still. Nothing happened for the last three months for them. And prior to that, people are already uh, getting worried in traveling. Airlines, uh, example, as well. In, in, in my uh, latest slide, I'm going to show how, how badly impacted they are. Uh, retail, yeah, everybody is going online now, uh, but uh, we see the brick and mortar company are actually closing, closing shop. Uh, some, some of the uh, big names in the industry, yeah. Uh, of course, logistics, uh, automotive, oil and gas, they are affected too. So, um, uh, I'm going to talk more about that later, yeah. Uh, moving on, uh, Caroline. <coughs> So what is the new normal? Eh? How we, how COVID-19 redefined the procurement and supply chain strategies? So I'm going to start with my item number one. Item number one of uh, the impact of this uh, to uh, of COVID-19 to the world is deglobalization. <clears throat> uh, deglobalization. Uh, actually, globalization started about 30 or 40 years ago uh, by the US uh, and most European uh, manufacturers. Uh, they, you can, you can move to the next slide. Uh, they actually try to find a cheaper alternative to build their, their products. But deglobalization uh, start uh, way back in, in the year 2000, probably 2014 or 2015, uh, during uh, Obama administration. <clears throat> they came up with the term reshoring. When everybody else go, going offshore, they tried to bring back uh, uh, some of the manufacturers back home uh, to, to ensure uh, the local uh, Americans have job to do, you know. Uh, and, and because of the reshoring initiative are not moving in so well, uh, Trump won the election because they say he wants to make uh, American great again. So by, by doing that, uh, he, during this time, the, the, the first term, he's bringing in a lot of uh, investment back in uh, in US, not that a lot though, <clears throat> but he's trying and giving up in, uh, incentives. So companies like Tesla are building the biggest factory in the world, uh, somewhere in Nevada. So he's, and, and by, by doing that, they're getting a lot of good incentives. And then COVID-19 start. Suddenly, hell break loose. Uh, oh, prior to that, uh, Trump has, has uh, started a, a trade war prior to COVID-19. So during the trade war, a lot of uh, American companies are thinking whether to, to be in China uh, or not. Yeah. So so after COVID-19 comes, everything be, become more logical to move back. Yeah. Moving on to the next slide. <coughs> uh, Caroline, another one. Okay, uh, see. Suddenly, China became not the only company in country in the world that, that can do uh, manufacturing. So uh, during the, the first two months of COVID-19, uh, Korea and Japan have, uh, have, have had a, a big problem getting, getting their parts for automotive coming from China because China has already closed, closed their, their, their logistic border. Yeah? And uh, a lot of US uh, supplies are not get, uh, getting <coughs> it in. So, at the first two months, people are thinking of moving uh, their manufacturing facilities elsewhere. So the main beneficiary will be ASEAN, yeah, <clears throat> because um, we speak the language um, uh, and it's easier to do business in Asia because of the location. So I see Vietnam, Malaysia, and, and uh, Indonesia are going to be uh, the front, uh, the forefront inside in the, uh, of this. This the next uh, one will be probably Thailand, yeah. So for for Europe, uh, I'm looking at. Um, Eastern European countries uh, to be the big beneficiaries, uh, especially for the European-based uh, manufacturers. Uh, and for the Americas, I think uh, Mexico and Canada will take uh, the, the lead advantage uh, on, on the decentralization uh, out of China. Okay, uh, next please. <clears throat> Okay, th uh, this is another uh, slide to show uh, that Mexico, Malaysia, and, and Japan, even Germany are uh, taking the advantage of companies uh, exiting China. Yeah. Uh, moving on um, is uh, IR 4.0 acceleration. So this uh, gonna gonna be something. Next slide, please. <coughs> Uh, IR 4.0 will, will accelerate, uh, will accelerate a lot uh, during this time. In fact, there are things that we never 
uh, seen uh, happening are happening right now. Like they are printing uh, 3D face shields, yeah, and um, people uh, people are on Zoom uh, all, all the time. I mean, this webinar wouldn't have been here if not because of this. Um, and um, in Malaysia during the Ramadan, we always have the Ramadan Bazaar, and it never happened before in all our lives to see uh, Ramadan Bazaar, Bazaar marketplace on ecom. Uh, and people are actually doing that. Um, the only downside, uh, I have not seen uh, drones uh, growing, uh, moving around all over uh, the world. Yeah, not, not in Malaysia, not anywhere, anywhere in the world. So I really hope to see more flying drones uh, to, to be accelerated uh, during this time. But I, I can't see not drones, not creator terbang either. Yeah. So moving to the next slide. Uh, I, I, we, uh, I also foresee there's going to be a rise and rise of uh, uh, what we call it the humanitarian logistics or disaster logistics. Uh, logistic emergency teams, uh, LET, is actually um, being mooted uh, uh, at the uh, World Economic Forum, uh, Forum in the year 2005. Uh, it started in 2007, uh, 2007 uh, seven, and it has been about 14 years uh, in, in operation and uh, focusing on 22 major natural disasters. Yeah? But 2020 has, has rewrite the whole uh, disaster logistic game because suddenly it's happening all over the world. It's not just at one location. Yeah? So I think um, military logistics and disaster logistics are going to be the in thing for, for, for in, in, in everything that we do huh, later. Yeah? Uh, moving on to the next slide, airlines and shipping lines. Um, you, if you can see from this slide, I mean, uh, uh, a lot of uh, airlines has been uh, uh, on receivership or bankrupt uh, during this time. And the last one was uh, Thai Airways. Um, you never thought Thai Airways was going to be down, yeah? It's, it's as big as uh, SIA, and I think it's even bigger than Malaysia Airlines. So uh, it, it, it does happen. And, and, and on, the sea, on the sea, the container shipping, uh, we, we see PIL having a having problem. So. I, I can see uh, it's going to be merger and acquisition soon uh, uh, on, on that part uh, also. So in, instead of long haul, uh, shipping lines and airlines are now focusing regional uh, and major shipping lines uh, also when I speak uh, to some of them, they are working more inland, become, become logistic, they become integrators. Uh, so uh, I saw the other day HMM launched the the biggest ship in the world, so I, w I wonder how how they're gonna manage uh, those big uh, boys on the sea when everybody's going regional number one, everybody's reducing their capacity, and uh, a, a lot of this uh, Grand Alliance, uh, New World Alliance services, they actually uh, reducing their their, sail their sailing services uh, on a monthly basis. Yeah, so it is a doom and gloom yeah, situation. Moving on to the next slide. But show must go on. Show must go on. We still need to do business. We need to capitalize what's uh, uh, in front of us. Um, next slide, please. Um, I, I think all the companies, uh, this is what uh, the, all the companies should do, uh, especially, uh, especially my company. Uh, number one, I actually going to put my people first. I'm going to make sure my staff are OK. Uh, they are safe, they, they work from home, and if they need to, to move uh, to the ports or visiting a client uh, premises, they need to cover all uh, the basic SOPs. Yeah? So that's first and foremost. Uh, number two, we need to still manage and communicate our stakeholders. We need to talk to our banks. We need to talk to our customers. We need to ensure this contract is moving or, or simply uh, renegotiate uh, the, the terms yeah? because of COD. Everything is having a problem. Yeah? Talk to your banks, uh, talk to your creditors, uh, talk to your vendors and suppliers. So it is important that uh, you keep in touch so that you plan and you know what's happening uh, uh, post-COVID. Yeah? Now, number three is about reshaping uh, the strategy of, uh, for your business can, uh, continuity. BCP is going to be uh, the main uh, topic. Uh, usually, BCP uh, or risk management it's always going to be the last uh, in, in the agenda, but I think BCP and, uh, and uh, risk management is going to be the first in the agenda for, for the next uh, one or two years at least. Yeah. So you have to re-evaluate re your liquidity, your, your, your finances, your, 
how, how long can you manage with what you, whatever you have. So this is important to relook at your business processes again. Yeah. Uh, number four is to build res uh, resilience to prepare for the recovery. Okay, th uh, this is uh, important. Uh, uh, after you plan uh, your strategies, how you execute your strategies. So personally, uh, as a global authority, uh, we, uh, we are looking at work from home. It's going to be a way to go. It's going to be a, a here to stay. In fact, uh, I've already started a, a form. You can apply for leave, or you can apply for work from home for the whole month or the whole two months. Shouldn't be a problem, yeah. Uh, and you need to come to the office only if there's a meeting that you need to be there. And otherwise, uh, if, if you have, uh, if you had to tend to your sick uh, parents uh, or, or your child might have problem, you can take care of your kids from home as long as you take care of your business. Right? So it should, shouldn't be a problem. So number five, number five, you should capitalize on all the uh, what you call initiatives by the government. Yeah. You make sure you get all uh, whatever that uh, on offer for SMEs, for individuals, for company, the tax exemption, the moratorium. You make sure you, you capitalize on that maximum, yeah, because that will help a lot um, in uh, managing all the uncertainties uh, during this time. Moving on, uh, Caroline. Okay, um, capturing early demand. Uh, this is, is the next step. Uh, I think. You have to be that flexible to see what else you can do in time meetings. For example, my company again, uh, we most of our customers, probably ninety five percent of our customers are construction based. Uh, but during the first two months of, of the MCO, there's no movement at all. So we quickly move uh, to pharmaceutical and uh, medical devices uh, market. We are actually uh, enjoying this. Um, and we book all our trucks uh, online. Uh, we use uh, lorry.com, e-truck, you know, high cargo, whatever uh, that is uh, ready to do online. We even uh, talk to our our vendors and use their, their uh, assets as well. Yeah? Um, so it's how flexible you are. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, we are capitalizing uh, on contactless economy. Uh, in fact, everybody must do that. And the, the first two months, we are trying hard to uh, take advantage of this. Um, uh, the first and foremost will be the payment gateway. Uh, we, we have, uh, for, as far as the contact with the uh, business, not a problem. But day-to-day -day business, we are moving in the, uh, on the uh, payment gateway. Yeah? Um, talking about the contactless economy, we attend all our sales meeting, all, all our uh, negotiation meeting, all by Zoom. So it become new, uh, new normal now. We have been uh, working via via WhatsApp uh, even during uh, uh, prior to COVID nineteen. Now more so, yeah. Uh, so, uh, but but the challenge is actually trying to um, uh, trying to uh, organize. Every, everything in one channel because uh, we are actually exploring uh, double up our efforts through our social media as well, our Instagram, our Facebook, Twitter. Uh, but sometimes inquiries come from all the channels. How you know organize, organize the challenges? How do you organize all the channels and WhatsApp into one? Yeah, so that you won't miss anything. So that that was the challenge. It was, it was great managing that. Yeah. So. Uh, that's what we did uh, for contactless economy. Uh, next slide is about uh, leveraging the data analytics. Yeah, and I would encourage everybody. This is the time to start to digitalize your uh, your business. This is the time. There's a lot of, of uh, digital uh, digital business feed up there that you, that you can sit down with, with them and discuss how do you digitalize them. Yeah, so. Uh, this is also the best time to learn and, and uh, to relearn and unlearn and relaunch whatever you have. Yeah, so please uh, embrace this. This is the, uh, the way to go. Yeah? Uh, going on to the next slide. Um, agility in supply chain. So uh, like what I mentioned earlier about uh, companies, uh, the shipping line became the integrators. So suddenly there's more, uh, if not, uh, a lot, there are opportunities uh, coming from the local company that, uh, that, uh, right here. So you will start to plan uh, your your purchases, your 
your your logistics nearer to where, to where you are and um from from all the way from raw material supply supply chain uh, manufacturing distribution and uh and everything so you need to be more agile uh, in uh, what do you call uh, um, managing and you know and and also this uh, murphy's law you know yeah, when yeah. it happens it happens at the right time so anyway <laughs> again uh we move to the next speaker uh adjunct professor nazri khalid i think he's uh, very well known in this uh, maritime industry he was um, uh it's been a panelist to and also paper presenters in uh, many conferences all over the world you know i think he's also published uh, hundreds uh, of uh, articles in journals also he wrote books and he's very active you know so those uh, of you in attendance uh, would like to learn uh, about writing a journal uh, things like that you can consult him you know of course his uh, most uh, prominent uh, position earlier was being part of this maritime institute of malaysia session that's um, mima you know a think tank under the ministry of transport and he is uh, very uh, well uh, experienced in the research because uh, he can come up with uh, any figures uh, you ask him he come up with uh, many type of figures you know and um, and currently he is uh, working with the uh, multinational company and also a big conglomerate in malaysia but uh, most of all his contribution and um, ability is uh, recognized by university of uh, malaysia terengganu uh, whereby he is uh, uh, what i call this uh, engaged as a adjunct professor so i think uh, uh, without further delay i would like to invite uh, professor mohammad nazri to present his uh, slide, presentation to make his presentation thank you over to you thank you very much hadi abi can uh, can everyone hear me loud and clear Yeah, yes, right. Thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, let me thank Aji Abi for the very flattering introduction and making me sound more productive than I actually am. Those three hundred articles that you mentioned also include snappy wine line remarks and puns on LinkedIn and also on social media. So I'm not sure to what extent that counts in my CV, lah. But uh, I'd like to think I know a thing or two about uh, research and writing, uh, having spent a decade at uh, this policy research institute called MIMA, Maritime Institute of Malaysia, as what Ajay Abi mentioned. And uh, uh, one of my favorite sayings is actually by the legendary boxer Muhammad Ali, who said, "It's not bragging if you can back it up." So uh, whatever element of bragging there was in that CV that. <laughs> that uh, Aji Abi uh, mentioned uh, I'd like to think there is some uh, some some backup there lah you know so I you know bragging rights is uh, I, is all mine anyway I also like to thank uh, uh, Jevan and his team uh, for putting this together and this is part of the new normal which uh, we are here to discuss basically but uh, the very fact that we are all uh, convening through this uh, platform also shows that we are all adopting the new normal and this is something which players along the uh, supply chain Uh, need to uh, quickly adapt themselves to, because uh, nothing is ever going to be the change here again. I mean, without being melodramatic about it, let's just uh, look at how we we are dressed these days. Suddenly, we all are covered in uh, hijabs, <laughs> in medical masks, something which ne- you never thought would would have happened unless unless uh, except during your trips to Japan. Yeah, to cover yourself up, uh, you know, face before you sneeze and. And spread all the virus to us, <laughs> and that's one thing. And then the other thing about social distancing, about uh, you know, about convening in this platform, about doing things differently, are all going to uh, shape and reshape our behavior, not only in the next couple of months, but uh, in many years to come. And of course, this is going to have an impact on uh, on production, manufacturing, uh, the way we move goods across the supply chain. The way we uh, we uh, uh, source out uh, materials, uh, parts, uh, the way we consume, the way we uh, finance our activities, things are going to be dramatically different. Even to a point where 
the old normal may no longer be recognizable and the, the landscape of uh, the supply chains, the marine industries, oil and gas industries, the transportation industries, uh, manufacturing services, uh, the whole economy, global trade as we know it to be will never be the same again. Okay, and uh, uh, my task is to uh, share with you a couple of slides on my take uh, on the topic uh, from a marine industry perspective. So, Carol, can I, can I just uh, flash my slides? Please. <clears throat> um, let me check because I don't recall having a fight hang on. Huh? Okay, let me just uh, go on by saying uh, uh, what uh, uh, Chief Ha is, uh, my brother, has uh, started off with, uh, sort of like uh, set up the stage quite nicely to not only this discussion uh, during this webinar, but also the very topic of how uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic will change the supply chain for good. And I think the key word here is really for good. I mean, already uh, we are preempting that the changes are not going to be a matter of if, it's already a matter of to what extent, what intensity, what magnitude. We can already see, you know, seismic changes, literally seismic changes. We, we don't use the word seismic, uh, you know, quite often, and uh, normally you use, it, you use it quite sparingly, right? But in the, in the case of explaining what is happening to logistics, supply chain, global trade, and so on movement of goods, raw materials from point of production uh, to the point of consumption, the word seismic is is uh, more than appropriate, seriously. Uh, the changes are lock, stock and barrel. They are very, uh, very significant. They are massive changes. And uh, they are, like I said, they're going to shape the uh, the, the face of a supply chain for, for years to come. Already we're seeing a lot of uh, multinational companies being very nervous about, uh, about their so-called single source approach or their overly dependence on a single source for raw materials and uh, parts and also even labor or even markets for that matter. And uh, all this stems from the fact that the pandemic originated from Wuhan, China. And China being uh, the second largest uh, economy in the world now, and uh, by, by the look of it will uh, supersede the largest economy in the world, which is the US, in about a decade's time. Uh, China has become so integrated and so deeply embedded into the global supply chains and although also global production and manufacturing system that you know the so-called proverbial when when it sneezes the rest of the world catches cold <laughs> it couldn't be more appropriate well the sneeze is coming from wuhan and look the rest of us is catching the cold right <laughs> uh, i'm not and i don't just mean that literally but also from the perspective of the changes that uh that, that it is triggering the pandemic which has resulted in uh in, uh, in uh, uh, movement restriction orders, lockdowns, uh, social distancing, changes in uh, consumption pattern, manufacturing, production, and so on, uh, triggering uh, you know, a domino effect, which is unlike we have never seen before. So that may, may sound flattering to the Chinese, which shows that they are so influential and so important in the, in the scheme of thing today, but it also, uh, uh, should trigger a lot of uh, you know us to put on our thinking cap about uh, our vulnerability and also the centrality of China, which you know may be good uh, to one extent because China you know is the world's largest, uh, most populous uh, nation, and uh, it is uh, rich with uh, raw material, its uh, its uh, location, uh, and also its uh, its uh, wealth, and also its uh, growing, rising economic uh, and even political influence uh, is actually generating a lot of good uh, for, for, for the rest of the world and also their trading partners. But at the same time, what is happening now should really give us uh, plenty of food for thought about our vulnerability uh, in our dependence with China. So, um, OK, uh, I'm preempting some of the slides. I'm about, I'm, uh, I was just uh, rattling off uh, trying to recall what are the points of my slides. Uh, next, uh, Carol. OK, uh, we can skip this part. Uh, I, I just want to uh, bring over the part then um, previous slide again and the um, uh, bullet point number three, I think is uh, number four. Um, what is happening is that, well, there's almost no, nothing good coming out from uh, from the pandemic, except that we are all a little bit more disciplined, a bit more, a bit more 
you know, considerate towards uh, other people in terms of lining up and so on. And uh, uh, but at the same time, from a business production manufacturing perspective, really there's not, not much good coming out of it. But we'd like to take a bit more optimistic view about it. Uh, us, you know, supply chain practitioners, professionals, and also uh, academia, we'd like to, to think that there's a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. There's some lessons uh, learned from from uh, from what's happening. So let's uh, move on uh, further. The world is in a bad shape currently. Let's not let's not mince words about it. But at the same time, uh, if we understand what are the adverse impacts, as uh, what I'm showing here in this uh, particular slide, and understand where they come from and what uh, led us to this current mess that we are in, I think uh, it will be a good start towards uh, resolving some of the uh, some of the issues that we're facing. Because you know uh, we should not be in denial that uh, the the current order or previous order of things actually have led us to the to the situation that we're in. So the impact on the marine sector, as you can well imagine, shipping facilities close to 95 percent of world trade by volume. So when the economy of the world is stalled as uh, what it is currently, you can just well imagine the, the adverse impact on the rest of the uh, of the uh, marine industry, not only uh, to to ship owners, but also to port operators, uh, shipyards, and a whole range of ancillary services uh, providers, uh, such as marine surveyors, uh, parts manufacturers, um, you know, registrars, um, uh, you know, classification societies, uh, naval arc, so many other uh, uh, industries, uh, subsectors servicing the uh, marine industry. Next. Also, I mentioned about the uh, the falling demand for for tankers, uh, which also. Uh, uh, has suffered from the double whammy of not only the pandemic but also the uh, price war that is uh, going on, oil price war between uh, Saudi and Saudi plus its uh, OPEC partners uh, against uh, Russia in their bid to uh, to uh, stem the uh, the rise of uh, U.S. shale players. Uh, these are all uh, figures which I, I just want to show you that uh, post COVID. Well, we're not past post COVID, so I really be, shouldn't be using the term post because we are still very much in the thick of it. And uh, of course, as we all know, uh, we are still uh, vulnerable to to, uh, to attacks uh, for as long as uh, we have not found um, a cure for uh, for COVID. Uh, the vaccine is still uh, you know, not uh, cured, so we are still uh, at risk until uh, you know, uh, um, you know, cure is found. So the impact on the uh, economies of the world, as you can see from this uh, particular diagram, is uh, adverse. Global trade has slumped. Uh, you know, more and more countries are dependent on trade to power their economic growth, and uh, as a result of uh, social distancing, transport being stalled, production manufacturing uh, affected badly. Uh, economies of uh, not a single economy really uh, in uh, in in the world today will ever record uh, decent growth. I think at best they can they can hope for is uh, not a steep inflation or recession. As it is, uh, you know, IMF, uh, World Bank. Uh, have already predicted a recession to the tune of about 1.5 percent to 2 percent uh, for for the world GDP for 2020. Next, <clears throat> uh, okay. Again, this is uh, you know the 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 part that uh, that backs up uh, all this uh, very dire and gloomy prediction about world economy, and these are all prediction coming from. Uh, very uh, um, authoritative sources like IMF, OECD, World Bank, and, and so on. And even our central bank, Bank Negara, and also uh, our treasury, and also MIER, the think tank of uh, economic think tank of uh, Malaysian government, also predicts uh, uh, have predicted uh, you know uh, very gloomy uh, forecasts ahead for Malaysia's economy. Next. <coughs> Uh, this one is uh, showing uh, the uh, uh, dependability or rather exposure of uh, of some European ports uh, to uh, to China, which to a certain extent reflects the um, the attachment or rather the the, the deep integration uh, uh, that many ports around the world uh, are having uh, prior to uh, the uh, outbreak of the pandemic. Uh, and again, as you can expect, uh, you know, using that analogy I just mentioned. When China uh, sneezes, the rest of the world catches flu. So obviously, with uh, you know port uh, ports in China not uh, operating at full capacity uh, due to the uh, lockdown and also due to the restriction of movement of, of people, uh, transportation, and so on, um, there have been a lot of uh, congestions and also uh, shipments uh, 
of uh, goods and cargoes being delayed and also um, cargo owners had no choice but to uh, use storage facilities at ports in China. And as a result of uh, the delayed shipment, and again, uh, taking into account the dependency of uh, many manufacturers and businesses and industries and consumers around the world towards China, uh, one can imagine the repercussion along the global supply chain when goods coming out and uh, going into China are stalled at their ports. Uh, last time I was in China, I remember seeing a T-shirt that says, God created heaven and earth, everything else is made in China. Including, uh, you know, T-shirts uh, that says, boycott China that uh, American protesters, uh, you know, are wearing and using during their rallies to, to boycott uh, Chinese-made products. Even those T-shirts are made in China. So that, that just shows, uh, you know, the the dependency on the, the world. On the, again, I, I, I'm just uh, showing this this uh, slide to give you an idea on the impact of the decline of uh, of uh, TEU or the uh, throughput of uh, some container ports with uh, what's happening uh, with, uh, with the pandemic and also the impact that uh, repercussions it has on, on Chinese ports. Next. <clears throat> Okay, this uh, shows uh, the uh, impact on uh, container port throughput, which is of course measured by the industry standard of uh, TEU or 24 foot equivalent unit, the uh, standard uh, measurement for, for containers uh, being carried on board uh, container ships. Uh, the key terminals here, uh, uh, of course, uh, those among some of the top 20 container ports in the world, uh, got close to about 10 or 12 of them are, are Chinese. Of course, uh, the biggest one being Shanghai port, uh, deep water young Shan port uh, only uh, superseded they have super, uh, that this particular port is superseded Hong Kong and also Singapore port in the last uh, five six years to emerge as the world's busiest container port by way of throughput volumes so uh, you can see that uh, a volume has uh, contracted uh, a little bit and a uh, prediction is that they are going to uh, suffer quite a significant drop in their throughput uh, volume by virtue of uh, falling demand uh, by consumers around the world for uh, manufactured goods and also for raw materials. Next. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, quite uh, useful to, to see. Uh, this uh, cape size is uh, basically a, um, a term used to describe bulk, uh, dry bulk carriers, which carry uh, dry bulk goods uh, such as uh, grains, uh, cement, uh, uh, construction materials, uh, minerals, and so on. Uh, you can see that uh, during the outbreak of uh, COVID, which uh, was first traced in China, I think back in December 2019, but uh, really made uh, worldwide news uh, around the time of uh, February or March uh, this year. Uh, you can see that the uh, the um, the uh, charter rates has uh, slumped quite dramatically from the from the uh, from the peak that uh, was that it it it, uh, it registered uh, close to uh, December 2019 and it was all downhill from there. Lah. And uh, this also mirrors uh, the situation with the tanker industry, which although now is uh, having a bit of purple patch because uh, since the uh, price uh, oil price war broke out, uh, there has been a huge demand for tankers mm -hmm. to uh, store unused oil um, produced by, uh, by uh, oil producers. Uh, with with uh, no buyers inside, so uh, this is all the the industry uh, uh, the industry uh, description of uh, oil at sea or oil on water, basically uh, referring to uh, crude oil which is being stored in uh, tankers, ULCCs, ultra large crude carriers, very large crude carriers uh, to store the oil which is not in demand currently. But uh, again, uh, that's a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a, uh, something which is quite unique because the rest of the uh, shipping trade, um, namely container, bark and so on, are suffering from severe drops and overcapacity currently. Uh, tanker is having a good run, which is also quite bizarre because only back in January, the charter rate for one ULCC was around 15,000 US dollars per day. But uh, currently it is uh, close to around $200,000 per day. So those who who, uh, who have uh, the tanker owners uh, will laughing all the way to the bank currently when they were just uh, only a few months ago uh, crying all the way away from banks. So it's quite a turnaround, a remarkable turnaround of, uh, of uh, fortune for them. Next, I believe this could be the last slide. 
Um, OK, this basically just to show uh, the impact uh, that uh, this will have on the rest of the supply chain. Again, uh, against a backdrop of the fact I just mentioned that 90 percent, 95 percent of global trade is carried by volumes. If you look at these figures, you know, all of these uh, industries, uh, all of these products which are uh, carried by containers uh, are on uh, suffering a severe contraction, all almost double digit with the exception of uh, you know IVs, 4%. The rest are all you know, above 10% contraction, contraction. So the, the impact uh, uh, will, have, uh, will, will be quite uh, severe to a container uh, shipping players at a time when uh, many were already ordering huge uh, container ships, even to the tune of 22,000, 23,000 TEUs, uh, which are around uh, quite close to the biggest uh, type of ships, container ships in operation uh, at the moment. So, uh, uh, can, you can just well imagine that with all these, uh, you know, products which are in demand uh, globally uh, contracting, the demand contracting like this, you can imagine the uh, repercussion on the uh, on the uh, container shipping sector. So um, basically, you know, I'm bearer of bad news, so shoot me in the head if you have to. But uh, later on during Q and A, we'll try to unearth some opportunities uh, available within this very bleak uh, outlook. Next. <coughs> Uh, the industry has uh, taken several uh, responses in order to clear the backlog of the supply chain and also try to uh, prevent the, uh, the spread of the virus uh, in terms of guidelines and, and so on. But at the same time, uh, it is not uh, a situation which uh, the marine industry or the shipping industry alone could uh, unwind. It needs, uh, you know, there are so many players along the supply chain and therefore uh, it takes uh, a lot of uh, effort from a lot of people to unchain the supply chain. Okay, pun intended, unchaining the supply chain. It also requires a lot of uh, very bold policy moves uh, and also a lot of uh, changes uh, that need to come along. And in fact, I'm thinking this is actually a great time to shape the industry uh, to its core. Uh, all the things that I have uh, have uh, um, that have uh, acted like a you know news around the industry's necks uh, and uh, been hampering the movement, smooth movement an efficient uh, uh, movement uh, flow of goods uh, along the supply chain should really be uh, have a deep rethink now about uh, dismantling some of the policies that no longer work and uh, policy makers need to be bold to introduce uh, new policies uh, in order to speed up the uh, the clearance of the supply chain which may take many many months to come next and this is where the use of technology i uh, uh, mentioned that in the last uh, bullet point in the previous slide uh, technology can be uh, leveraged on and uh, be uh, you know optimized uh, to help uh, speed up the clearance of goods uh, that are stuck along the supply chains. So unfortunately, uh, the way I see it, I don't have a crystal ball in front of me. I only have this uh, thing, which my family gave me for my last birthday. I'm trying to be a uh, half smiley about it. Uh, it's not a full smile, but uh, it's a bit of a uh, sarcastic kind of smile, and I. I do feel that at the end of it, you know, we are all bleeding. Yeah, it's a bloodbath out there. There's, uh, you know, a lot of uh, people who are suffering, companies filing for bankruptcy, mass layoffs. But at the same time, you know, uh, the the world is, the, the modern civilization runs on global trade. And again, if you, if you just recall that 95% of trade is carried by ships, you will know that the demand for shipping services and marine industries, uh, port services will always be there. It's just a matter of intensity, matter of magnitude, matter of the, the, the uh, resilient ones, uh, uh, being able to uh, withstand the uh, the current blip, and uh, of course, uh, it is a very volatile industry, uh, full with uh, peaks and troughs and ups and downs. But at the end of it, uh, you know, on the the tough ones will survive, and ports, shipping, and marine industry will always be relevant. So the the sec the the all looking at the segments, nothing uh, is good for the next couple of months, except maybe tanker segment. But even that, also the party may come to an end soon once uh, oil price gets back to decent levels and demand for oil picks up again once uh, movement restrictions, lockdowns uh, are lifted. And of course, uh, we can tell even uh, on the streets, you know, cars are back on the roads, trucks are back on the roads, people are going to start flying again. So the, all this will will uh, result in a, an uptick in demand for oil and also other goods and services, uh, which uh, I think augurs well for the, uh, for the uh, marine industry. So uh, in conclusion, yes, it's a bloodbath out there. It's painful, but uh, you know, even the darkest of storm, uh, the worst of hurricanes will eventually, uh, you know, be uh, followed uh, subsequently by uh, sunshine. So uh, until we get to that sunshine part, 
let's hunker down, fasten our seat belt. It's going to be a hard ride, a rough ride. But at the same time, let's be optimistic uh, because it won't be the end of the world so soon. Thanks. Oh, last ride. OK, fortune favors the brave. OK, I'm always reminded by this saying that the word crisis in, in Chinese also contains the word opportunity. I'm not an expert. I keep on hearing this, but I need to, to do a bit more research on that. But I like the sound of it. You know, I like the, the, the fact that, you know, even in crisis, uh, you know, there's always opportunities. Look, without meaning to be crude about it, I mean, uh, you know, the, the funeral parlors are doing great business now during COVID. You know, face mask manufacturers, <laughs> glove manufacturers, they're doing well. So again, you know, th that's not to say they're capitalizing on people's misery. But what I'm saying is there's always, uh, you know, something good that comes out from the worst of situations. And I, I have no doubt that, you know, us uh, human beings have always had the capacity to rebound and what more people in the supply chains, you know, they're full of very resilient, macho people like uh, Faiz, like Tuanaji Abi, like Marco. And I'm sure that later on we'll be able to collectively, uh, you know, uh, unearth some good points together to uh, unchain the supply chains and also to uh, live with a new normal arising from the changes uh, that COVID uh, will have on the supply chains for good. With that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, it was an excellent uh, presentation. I think uh, a lot of uh, uh, ideas been thrown into this. Yes, uh, talk about the silent killer impact. And uh, probably uh, a lot of people will be interested to know later on, for example, uh, since uh, COVID deadline or end date is still uh, not determined, how could we adjust ourselves to 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 sort of uh, come to a soft landing, you know? Because at the end of the day, whether we went through what we went through is um, uh, rough seas or air turbulence, rough air turbulence, uh, people will remember how we come to land at the airport or get to birth at the port, you know? So, okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Nazri. Now, I think uh, we reserve all those questions uh, later on. I would like to um, I call, call upon uh, Professor Dr. Marco to give his um, presentation. And as I mentioned early on, Dr. Marco has been uh, one of the well-known um, uh, experts in the logistics, in particular the halal industry in Malaysia. And he has been... Um, living in Malaysia for many, many years to really understand what this uh, logistic industry is all about. So he is uh, attached to a few universities as uh, professors, adjunct professors, and he's been doing research work also uh, on many topics. He, he is in the midst of uh, launching his new books, you know. So let's hear from him what he's got to say on this uh, topic today. Yes, Dr. Marco. Uh, how are you doing? You can all hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Thank you much. And I'd also like to thank the participants uh, for, for being here uh, today uh, for this webinar. Uh, I would like to thank MV International and uh, Health University for inviting me uh, to speak here. And I've seen a lot of uh, friends uh, also here uh, today uh, at the panel. Uh, Faiz and Azri uh, sharing important data, I think, uh, for everybody to know. Um, yes, we are living in uh, uh, special times. Uh, I think uh, history will probably remember uh, 2020, not only as the um, corona crisis, but also, I think, um, the end of the uh, industrial era and the official start of the information era. Uh, so these are important times we are living in, so it's important to learn uh, and to prepare as well. Um, what I would like to share with you, uh, some thoughts I have on what happened in the last months and also maybe some uh, strategies uh, and direction also for uh, the future. 
Um, hè, wat happened in maart in, uh, in Malaysia hè, was een lockdown. In Malaysia we call it an MCO. Which was a big surprise, I think, for a lot of people. That came abruptly into force. Uh, industries uh, were forced to close down. Uh, some industries were on the list of essential activities and services that were allowed uh, to, to operate. Uh, but as supply chains are not one-to-one -one change, but uh, global networks. Uh, slowly but surely, in a matter of days, the global supply chains came to a halt. Not only in Malaysia, during that same month in March, uh, globally all borders were being closed and all industries were locked down. So that lockdown was not only a lockdown of people, but also certainly a lockdown of industries. Um, and that is something new. Uh, it is a big test case because the last time it happened was probably the first and the second world war. So we are kind uh, in, an, um, in a war scenario. So we saw a domino effect happening of uh, companies not able to source, not able to produce and not able to deliver. At the other side, we saw uh, panic buying by the consumer, uh, toilet paper and uh, other uh, so-called essentials, food products and bread, which were later <laughs> thrown away. Um, also panic buying by uh, procurement departments, uh, which results in a bullwhip effect, which is a very big uh, demand growth uh, further uh, upstream the supply chain. Um, yeah, what we see now in the, after what happened in March, the lockdown is that a lot of companies run into trouble, uh, cash flow problems, companies uh, borrowing money, uh, so also worsening uh, the solvency uh, ratio. Uh, so these are uncertain times uh, for companies uh, that need action. Um, so are industries prepared? Uh, in Asia, we have a lot of industries that maintain uh, high debt levels. Uh, you see low asset utilization um, in industries, low margin, and you see a lot of short-term contracts with customers. So this makes uh, uh, companies in Asia vulnerable. Uh, supply chains today are complex, long uh, supplies from all over the world, uh, which makes uh, supply chains vulnerable. Uh, over the past uh, years, uh, uh, over the past 10, 15 years, we had the religion, a new religion in supply chain uh, that talked all about Lean Six Sigma. Uh, so what was important for industries to squeeze out the last dollar out of your supply chain. Um, all those practices, those black belt, Lean Six Sigma trends and hypes, uh, didn't create bodybuilders or athletes. Unfortunately, it created anorexia patients. So supply chains became very, very fragile and vulnerable, uh, which the result that we have seen um, in this uh, corona crisis. So what are important supply chain strategies that are needed? Uh, so in the past, uh, the supply chain paradigm was lean and agile supply chains, uh, cost focus and risk management was not a priority. Um, in the service industry, uh, logistics service providers have really neglected uh, risk management. There are no proper risk mitigation and crisis manuals uh, by logistics industry. Um, so the new era requires robust and resilient supply chains need to address risk and reputation management by uh, organizations urgently uh, to better prepare to be more uh, resilient um, uh, in their supply chain. What are the implications for supply chain strategy? First of all, um, is procurement. Uh, I think uh, uh, procurement uh, needs, to, needs to change. Um, Procurement traditionally um, sourced from um, single countries, even single suppliers, uh, focusing on where can I find the cheapest supplier, even if it's on the other side of the world, let's buy from that supplier to get the cheapest cost. Um, if there's a new supplier on the moon, then try to get a product from the moon, just to try to, to reduce cost. 
uh, that made uh, supply chains very vulnerable. So instead of single country sourcing, we have to go to multiple country sourcing. Instead of uh, global sourcing, we have to look at local or regional sourcing. Um, multinationals also have been uh, centralizing production uh, globally or regionally based on uh, their machine equipment, based on their technology, uh, which is a big risk. Uh, also, uh, I've been working in halal certification with multinationals where it makes halal also complex. Risk management becomes complex when you centralize. So decentralization is much more preferred uh, where you based your production on the needs of the regional market. So in case of your plant is flooded in Thailand, that you can still supply from a different plant in another region instead of centralization, where, which has big implications for, uh, for your distribution to markets. Um, so what we have seen is that we are now, uh, it's three months uh, from the start of the industrial lockdown, uh, that for many companies, unfortunately, is also highlighted by Faiz and Nazari, uh, that the industrial lockdown uh, created uh, an economic whirlpool, and the whirlpool became a maelstrom uh, with uh, Vortex uh, dragging companies deep into the ocean. Uh, life buoys have been thrown by governments uh, through cash, support and loans, but I'm afraid this is not sufficient and this might be not sufficient and that Vortex will further bring pulling companies down under. So it is time that companies take action themselves. So what is urgently needed by companies? In order to get out of that Vortex, so you need to first strategize, relook at what are the products I should produce look at what are the stock keeping units to, to have in my portfolio. Focus, laser focus on that top 20% that generates 80% of your revenue. Forget about those other SQs at the point in time. Secondly, also restructure your value chain. So those activities that do not contribute to your customer in offering that top 20, remove those activities that can be outsourced, outsource those. The beauty from outsourcing is that uh, when you outsource, so your fixed cost becomes variable cost, which will be very handy uh, in cases uh, to manage your cash flow and also solvency uh, ratio as well. Um, the third important uh, supply chain restructuring measure it will be relook at your processes. Where is my bottleneck in my processes? Where should it be that bottleneck in my process? And protect that bottleneck and control that bottleneck as a shark. Um, inventories cost a lot of money. It costs about 25% of the value of that inventory holding per year. Secondly, inventories, the higher your inventory, the higher your supply chain lead times. So reducing uh, your supply chain, uh, uh, your inventory also uh, uh, fast tracks, increases uh, the, the speed of your supply chain. Finally, you have to work together. So leverage uh, your collaboration within your own supply chain, uh, which is called vertical collaboration. Secondly, also work together with other supply chain networks. It can be even your competitors. So in order to survive this vortex, this crisis where a lot of companies are in, uh, you need to strategize, redefine your category, um, relook at the value chain uh, to release unnecessary baggage. Thirdly, increase your speed by removing unnecessary inventories. And finally, working with the best teams. So these four strategies are important uh, to get out of this. Um, what are some final thoughts? Um, um, there are a lot of hands out by, by governments. Uh, I'm a little bit concerned. Uh, Faye says it's good uh, to take whatever is given by the government. Sure. Um, however, regarding loans, I'm very careful. Um, 
as mentioned by those other speakers, uh, we are entering a new normal and I don't get any indication from the Malaysian government, but also not from other governments that we are going back to normal. So apparently um, this is not in the short term or even mid term going to change. So, uh, so if you're using loans, say your solvency ratio is severely um, affected. Uh, therefore, I should be very careful for companies uh, to, to increasing uh, borrowing. Um, I think you foremost have to look how can I adapt my business and operating model to survive. Um, also good to look at emerging requirements and on the webinar of this Friday, we will also move into digitalization. Um, we're moving into a new era of um, information, so it's important that companies embrace digitalization to, in order to support the e-commerce business. Um, embrace collaboration within your supply chain, but also with your uh, competitors even uh, to create a better team, a better supply chain network. Um, although some people and even academics argue uh, that uh, the sustainability agenda is now away, it might be on the, the background for the time being, uh, because we're all flooded with the, the, the corona uh, issues. Uh, I'm afraid we'll come back double in double speed and double height. So companies need to uh, prepare themselves also on the sustainability and greening area. So if you haven't been started, if they have a big roof space, you know, uh, solar panels, it might be something uh, to, to look at. Um, what we have seen in the, the industrial lockdown that a lot of damages were created by industries that were not allowed to operate. Um, I am convinced uh, that uh, there will be value in operating from large industrial zones that are better controlled. So when there is a uh, next lockdown, which is very likely uh, to be used as an instrument again, as now being tested and, uh, and activity plans and uh, and those mitigation plans are ready by governments, by military and police to, to enact again. Um, there will be advantages to produce manufacture from industrial zones. Uh, last week was in the news that uh, Friesland Campina, a big dairy uh, multinational uh, in Malaysia, moving their production uh, to a halal park in Malaysia, uh, close by the airport. So I think that that is a good move. Uh, so it will be probably I think uh, one of the important uh, uh, requirements for to move uh, forward. Um, yes, so this was my uh, final thoughts, and I would like now to to pass it back uh, to Twan Haji Abisofian. Thank you. Thank you much, uh, Professor Dr. Macro, Macro, uh, for the uh, exciting thoughts you shared with us, and I can see. A few new things um, from your presentation. For example, you talk about digitalization and greening your supply chain. I think the um, most uh, relevant in terms of uh, all these things is uh, how to make uh, the, 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 the new system or the new normal of supply chain to be more productive and effective. So those are hidden behind your your points on this uh, uh, what you call this uh, bottlenecks uh, lean six sigma and laser focus and all those things you know so anyway so we've uh, finally completed the uh, presentation side uh, section now uh, i believe there are a number of uh, comments that are coming in so we would like to get this uh, some of these questions addressed. Uh, I have not seen any particular question directed to any particular speaker. So uh, probably I'll start with um, the earlier thoughts uh, given by some of the speakers. For example, uh, whether this is the time to um, rationalize uh, everything or, or to rebuild the uh, logistic uh, supply chain industry. For example, getting better policies in place, regulations, SOP, 
you know, as, as what we, we, we've seen in the past uh, uh, few months, not only in Malaysia, almost everywhere, the issue is clear and a proper SOP is one of these. So do you think that this is one of the areas uh, for the industry to look at? You know, uh, in terms of, for example, bottleneck at uh, certain uh, particular places uh, along the supply chain. To me, this is a processes. It's the lack of clarity, probably, you know. So that is uh, probably a, a, a first point to look at, you know, among other things. What do you think, uh, Professor Nazri? Okay, um, obviously, uh, it's a thing, it's the least sexy uh, part about discussing uh, supply chains, procedures, uh, you know, processes, flow charts, how to get things from A to Z. But uh, processes and procedures are essential. They are the elixir or rather the oxygen of uh, smooth movement of goods along supply chain. And as we know, we, this is a cliche among practitioners in the supply chain that a supply chain is only as strong as its weakest link, right? And the weakest links normally almost always occur because uh, there is a bit of a gray area in terms of procedures. When people are left to their own device to sometimes decide on their own rather than follow procedures, uh, they, it can cause quite a black hole or rather a Bermuda Triangle that, that sucks, uh, you know, um, uh, things into it. And uh, of course, um efficiency uh time uh and also smooth movement of uh, of goods are all uh so called uh, paramount to any movement of supply chain and because uh, time uh is money so the the longer things uh, take to move across across supply chains and uh, the longer they are stuck along some parts of the supply chain due to uh, bad procedures or, 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 or absence even of procedures, they need to be looked into. And this is a time when uh, actually a lot of loopholes are emerging and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, identification of gray areas uh, have come up from the current situation. And uh, even MNCs, uh, again, I mean, this is human nature. We, we, we don't take stock of what's happening during good times. It's only during bad times like this that we start to figure out, okay, what happened? Uh, during flooding, for example, nobody would even bother to look at even further than their own backyard that the longkang or the, uh, the, the 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 little drain that is uh, causing uh, you know clogging can actually lead to a big uh, flooding across the neighborhood, across states, across the country even. So uh, all these things actually uh, require a bit of uh, deep diving into what other procedures are. And, and again, I'm speaking in general, but I do believe that this unsexy, unattractive part of our supply chain discussion needs to be looked at quite deeply by the practitioners. And of course, not just by the practitioners, but also by policymakers and even in the research community who can actually give a very balanced, objective and unbiased view about things. So I think uh, uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken, there's also a question about policies uh, posed by one of the uh, uh, members of the audience. And I think we, it can be answered concurrently with that question. Uh, we look to, we need to really look into uh, into uh, the policies which have been hampering movement of supply chains in the country and also those which have added to the cost, added to the time of moving goods across. I mean, uh, over the years, many uh, platforms have been established. At, at Tuan Haji, uh, Faiz, you and I belong to uh, earlier discussions about uh, Malaysian Logistics Council right, in the early days and uh, studies of the studies have been done by our friends in the industry, people like Dr. Amin, uh, people like uh, Marco, you've done some studies on, on uh, the supply chain, move, improving the uh, last mile connectivity. All these things are just a question of implementing them, and also maybe tweaking them a bit. And uh, uh, no doubt that, uh, you know, a lot of things need to be tweaked at, at the moment. But to me, again, I want to look into the uh, positivity side of it. The current situation is presenting us with a golden opportunity to right what has always been wrong about this industry. And God forbid we are not learning from this. And God forbid our policymakers are still slumbering, playing politics and not taking this opportunity to improve things. Because uh, we need, if there's a time for us to get going and uh, to really move things up, it is right now, right, right now. Okay. Okay, right. Uh, Sounds right, like a political speech, but uh, there you go. Undi <laughs> la saya, okay, president. <laughs> okay, let's uh, see uh, another uh, what you call this uh, 
matter raised by the participant, uh, that is the organization. Then uh, another question, what shall be the requirement for logistic and supply chain professional in post COVID-19 need to acquire? How does it differ between uh, pre-COVID and post-COVID? So that was uh, one of the questions. Maybe uh, Faiz would like to take up this? Hello? I already unmuted myself. Thank you very much, ah, okay. Dr. Najee Abi. <clears throat> um, uh, responding uh, to, your, to your question, to capture this opportunity uh, in the road of recovery of COVID-19, it is essential that uh, businesses or individuals have a clear, si clear sense of um, crisis-driven transformations. Uh, and they, uh, they must be ready to create a plan to eliminate what needs to be done. And we must know who need, who who's supposed to, to do it as well. Yeah? So the future may not be what it used to be. Well, we ought to start thinking uh, about how to make it work. Uh, so uh, answering the, the actual uh, uh, question, I may need to go back to my slides. So uh, I'm going to answer that in, 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 in four points. Uh, one is uh, capturing uh, the early demands, uh, visualization of uh, contactless economy, leveraging uh, data analytics, and also back to the agility of supply chain eh? uh, and also operation and risk management. So capturing uh, early demand is basically positioned well during this period to take advantage of the opportunities offered during the post-pandemic. Uh, we need to develop a detailed restart plan, stepping up on the line, uh, mindshare, identifying uh, uh, pockets of uh, profitable, profitable growth, uh, identifying uh, uh, opportunities, uh, pricing tactics, uh, optimizing the omni-channel and the marketing mix, uh, and providing the best service to the core uh, of the client, yeah? and uh, be mindful also the, the, the impulse purchasing has so much, so much decline because they have so much, so much time to think whether they need to buy it or not. Uh, but having said that, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? The TV, uh, TV uh, selling channels uh, like GoShop uh, have been making uh, good progresses. Uh, let me give you an example. My mom uh, has, uh, has been uh, buying all those stuff and sent it to my doorstep. And since it's COD, I have to pay for them myself. So thank you, mom, uh, if you're watching. <laughs> Your so, mom and my mom should get together, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so next is what uh, the virtualization of a contactless economy. Prepare well for this change. Revisit uh, your entire customer journey from uh, brick to mortar businesses, from physical sales channels, and actually going into this uh, contactless economy uh, where, where sometimes you don't need to interact with customers uh, at all. Um, uh, suddenly we have uh, customers uh, all the way from China selling to customers all the way in Europe and you are managing it in Malaysia. So, so this kind uh, of flexibility you need to have in, in, this, in this world of a contactless economy. Because when you say contactless, it's not just you and your customer in Kuala Lumpur. It can be in Shanghai, it can be in Paris or, or Bangkok. So, so it's good. Your, your borders is actually uh, grown or, or, or in other words, there's no more borders. Yeah? So while doing that, you need to maintain uh, the physical touch, the high degree of the human connection and increase your e-presence uh, in, in all this, the distribution channel. So but by doing that, we need to go into all the, what do you call, social media. I'm trying to be wherever I am. So whoever followed me on LinkedIn, suddenly you have a lot of my posts everywhere. I just need to be, to be seen because I cannot actually meet you physically. I'll try to do it online. Yeah? So probably a, a little bit too much. Yeah? And then um, leveraging on uh, data analytics, generate an awareness on, uh, on, on uh, analytic uh, capabilities. For business, for yourself uh, individually, if you have anything on uh, data analytics, that could be a good skill right now. I mean, a lot of people gonna gonna sign you up just at that. Uh, if you have that, study and highlight uh, the successful use cases of uh, data implementation uh, within your organization and also your competitors. So leverage uh, analytics, data analytics. Uh, through the cycle growth 
of your of your company yeah and last but not least um, the agility in uh, in supply chain uh, in terms of operations manufacturing risk management so most businesses um, are basically uh, affected uh, by disruption uh, disruption yeah i want to focus in supply chain redesign and next shoring yeah so um, define what's the best place uh, to be near your your customers so if, if your customers is in jb you can get somebody in jb to do it for you and you don't need to even open up an office in jb in jb your your team in jb can work from their home and can still manage the the businesses nearer to to, to the customer base uh, and then um, define what needs to keep uh, with the techn technological changes Uh, near innovative supply bases, accelerate the use of the technology, flexibility. If you can do robotics on the or oh, the IR 4.0 initiative, uh, the manufacturing product using, and you, you the advantage also uh, you can train your your workforce all the way online, and, um, and uh, the ability to deliver a, a potential business. Uh, to all your your network uh, all around so that's about it uh, uh, to ajabi yeah the four point for me thank you <clears throat> okay thank you so basically uh, one has got to understand to learn and understand what the industry needs you know so whatever skill that you can acquire especially for individual uh, you must uh, do the right thing you know for example now a lot of uh, free webinars around make an effort to join them uh okay professor dr macro i don't know who who's uh, why is it noisy suddenly dr macro yeah uh, you know we we used to talk about for example in the supply chain uh logistic <coughs> village or urban village uh, urban logistic village so do you think that uh, with this kind of uh, challenges uh the food supply for example can be impacted by this uh, covid 19 and especially more to the uh what i call this retail we talk about uh, retail uh, how what are the factors that uh, can contribute <coughs> to the retail taking advantage you know because uh, most of the people are going online this kind of thing you know so do we see any real advantage uh, moving forward maybe you want to touch in terms of food supply which is uh, you know the halal market for example yeah thank you abi sofian um well i think first of all uh, if you talk about city logistics urban logistics uh, well, everybody now goes to e-commerce So you see a big boom of e-commerce delivery, uh, uh, exploding a number of order lines uh, in uh, in logistics. Um, so it is extremely important that the logistics industry start organizing themselves. So uh, uh, we have to relook really at urban logistics again, city logistics, to organize that better. And we cannot have that for every meal and every purchase online and we have a separate motorbike coming to your house and that will be disastrous we can do that far more smarter so we need to organize uh, city logistics again as part of sustainability and it should be back on the agenda definitely very important so that's um, uh, a set an activity for the logistics industry that has to come together and to convince uh, governments of metropolis such as Kuala Lumpur had to start pilots with that. So uh, the logistics industry uh, um, has to do that and help university. We are most pleased uh, to facilitate and participate in that, that uh, process. Uh, regarding to halal, um, uh, your, your second question. Um, Yeah, so halal is important for a lot of Islamic countries. We have 57 Islamic countries officially, according to the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Uh, most of those uh, Islamic countries are, uh, unfortunately, are net importers. So they're not, uh, they, have, they have real big problems with food security. 
Um, Saudi Arabia has already taken action uh, to, to make big purchases uh, regarding securing food into the kingdom, but also purchasing of abattoirs like in Brazil. Uh, Indonesia is a good example where uh, halal industry development is a top priority for the Indonesian government and the, the leadership of Pak Jokowi. Um, halal parks are being developed in Indonesia, such as modern Halal Valley, where I am personally involved in, and where halal clusters are created. So Indonesia wants to become a leading producer of, of halal ingredients and halal products for the world. Um, Saudi Arabia is also developing industrial clusters in the kingdom, also to develop uh, halal products for the world. So. I am very happy to see that although uh, the COVID-19 uh, gives a lot of problems, uh, Islamic countries are seeing now the light that they have to take action in um, taking an equal responsibility of consuming halal also to produce halal. And so Saudi Arabia and Indonesia are a great example of that, that they're working uh, on that, and hopefully also Malaysia uh, can uh, also work hard on uh, reviving the agriculture sector as well. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Yeah, uh, <coughs> since you are talking about um, uh, digitalization in, in this uh, your presentation uh, as an emerging uh, requirement, so how do you see the level of uh, digitalization in uh, supply chain in Malaysia. A question for and me. What are the challenges? Yeah, what are the challenges? Sorry. Um, the logistics industry has been far behind uh, in in Malaysia on investments on IT. Um, that was also due um, to the high use of manual labor. Uh, so Malaysia has been using a lot of manual labor. Uh, in logistics operations. Uh, but secondly, also coming back to procurement, is that a lot of contracts uh, between shippers and the logistics service providers were only one, two year, one or two year contracts, which is ridiculous. So this did not allow logistics players to invest in IT, to invest in automation. So. Um, the level of investment in automation and uh, also digitization is far behind in Malaysia as compared to other countries. Even Thailand is further than, than Malaysia. So Malaysia needs to do up to some catch up, needs to do urgently uh, in order to support also that, that big boost of the e-commerce e industry in order to facilitate that. So I'm afraid that there will be a shake out of logistics players in the Malaysian logistics industry uh, that are not transforming themselves uh, to embrace e-commerce and embrace digitization. Um, paper-based supply chains, paper-based processes are history. So if you're still running your logistics company based on paper-based processes, you could be toast. All right. So um, uh, uh, I'm asking uh, Jivan, uh, how many more minutes do we have? Um, uh, hello, Caroline. Uh, you can go on as long as you're like. If there are questions. Oh, okay, that's that's good. That's okay. good. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I, we can coming back to that. Uh, 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 yeah. Hello? We have a few questions. You can go on with the. You can select the question. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just uh, picking up the topic, you know, not specifically the, as a question in there. I think I've touched a number of that. Okay. Uh, now let's uh, talk about, uh, you know, further about this uh, digitalization or automation. <coughs> like, uh, why is in your experience uh, dealing with these uh, industry industry players? Do you think this? Um, I mean, what is the gap you talk about the, the traditional supply chain players as compared to, uh, for example, these uh, startup, you know, the technology startup, just like you mentioned that you yeah, you ordering, uh, booking your trucks uh, using these online companies, that kind of thing. So in relation to what uh, <coughs> Professor Marco said about 
Malaysia being mm. behind this, are you seeing anything uh, different from it? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ajabi. Uh, before I, I continue uh, answering the question, um, I need to leave in 10 minutes' time uh, because I have another meeting after this. Um, sorry, Caroline, I, I cannot be for as long as you want me to be. And, um, um, and given, uh, I, I need to leave by, by one. Okay, back to your question, Ajabi. Um, I am a member of SAFLA, uh, Selangor Stakeholders and Logistics Association. Uh, with that, uh, we are automatically a uh, member of Federation of Malaysian Stakeholders. <coughs> and uh, I'm also the VP for uh, Persatuan Pengusaha Logistik Bumi Putra. Um, and uh, I am a proud uh, chartered member of Chartered Institute of Logistic Transport. And uh, I mentioned all these four big, big organizations, not just to drop names. Yeah? I mentioned uh, this organization to say that 90% of our members are practically brick and mortars. I'm going to get phone call from them after this, but yes, we are basically uh, moving uh, brick and mortar. So the other 10% uh, the other 10 might move a little bit here and there into uh, digitalization. When I say digitalization, Again, it's not pure digital. Um, it is web-based, online, uh, or mixture of both. Yeah. Uh, but the, the one that really uh, changing the changing the game plan, changing the the landscape of the, the business, are th those startups. These people are not even logisticians. They are IT go the IT guys doing logistics. And we, uh, a lot of us here, right here, are logistics trying to do IT. Yeah. So probably we don't invest that much. Uh, we, we are hoping to still do this more because we can charge more to our clients. Because um, having, uh, having a digital platform, uh, all, all your pricing uh, visible. Yeah. I mean, let, let's take a good example lorry.com. Lorry.com. Uh, it is not the answer for uberization of uh, logistics, but from my point of view, he is close. Yeah, um, you you can know uh, if, you, if you want to send cargoes, big size, small size. You want to relocate. You will immediately know what's the cost uh, of, of movement from point A to point B, as far as nation is concerned. Immediately, in fact, uh, you can do that. I, I do that all the time to compare with my. Um, physical uh, quotation from my vendors, from my truck vendors. I would say, hey, why Lorry.com is offering that? And why not you? So this kind of visibility, and they are quite fast. We have, they have all the algorithm to, to, to quote you almost immediately. You try to get from uh, another truck operator, it will take you half a day or sometime the next day. Yeah. So not, another one is iCargo. Uh, so, so these are the guys who are changing the landscape, and and people like us, uh, from from the uh, the brick and mortar businesses trying uh, to enter uh, the, the 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 logistics uh, business uh, online, yeah, the, the the digitalization, and this is touching just uh, one example from a lot a lot more, yeah. So uh, the feeling all around is moving towards it. Uh, but I tell you, most of my uh, colleagues, uh, my, um, they still don't have any idea what digitalization is all about, and because they can still make money. Yeah, but COVID has actually changed the way all of us think. Uh, thank God to COVID. <laughs> can I say that? Uh, it because it really accelerates uh, the IR 4.0 and uh, moves a lot of businesses into. Uh, digitalization. That's my point of view to Ajabi. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank, thank you, Faiz. Uh, since you are going away, I think uh, just another one question. Uh, you, you talk about this uh, startup. I'm excited about this, uh, especially uh, when it's uh, transparent. So, do you think it's um, this is one of the areas for SMEs, especially uh, the the owners that you know to do the real right business because i've heard during this COVID, for example many smes are finding difficult to continue with their business so will digitalization and also e-commerce be part of their game changer 
definitely it's going to be definitely uh okay the, the main uh i, I don't want to say show stopper the, the main roadblock uh, to this is basically she don't really understand uh, there's a word uh, for uh, from offline to online yeah o to o uh, from online to uh, offline to online so you need they need we all need to attend uh, this kind of uh, seminars or classes just to know which part of our uh, our processes can, can be digitalized and, uh, and and how to capitalize on uh, that online yeah so once you do that you will realize that suddenly your marketplace is everywhere if you are uh, operate operate from uh, port clan right now or some of your branches all over all over the ports in malaysia or the airports in malaysia suddenly you are talking directly to the consumer it's not b2b anymore it's b2c so and and um, and that is not it not just it you are also talking about crossing the uh, the border so you can you can get with the right uh, investment on your on your seo um uh, Overseas customers can find you online and actually ask you to do the business for them. Uh, simple businesses like uh, DDP, DDU, the clearance in Portland, uh, clearance in KLA, you will, you will get that because they can find you online. They can Google and find you instead of uh, asking their local partners, asking their agents to do it for you. Yeah. So, so that, that kind of visibility suddenly you have businesses from all over the world. Um, I myself um, uh, at Asia, uh, Asia Global Total Logistics, uh, we are a member of World Cargo Alliance. Yeah, World Cargo Alliance uh, is, is a is a net, uh, logistic uh, networking uh, where we have about six thousand members from all, all over the world. And even then, uh, where uh, I know I have I have um, network all over the world, all over the ports and airports all over the world. It's not that fast. I will only get my my code. 24 hours or probably 48 hours later and and because of the the time changes sometimes we got a delayed response yeah so but when we have everything digitalized online you got it on the spot and when people can discover you online you cut down uh, your your marketing cost because people actually found you not the other way around thank you ajabi hey thank you I think uh, this is one of the area. I'm just I'm, I'm now talking on behalf of this uh, chapter in city of logistics and transport, whereby uh, it is based in uh, UK, but it has uh, over 30 branches uh, worldwide. So the, those uh, members have access to uh, opportunities uh, for business, for example where CLT now is uh, focusing on uh, international business forum. So this is uh, some of the ideas for people who are members of CLT can uh, look for opportunities uh, to move worldwide, you know. Okay, it's, uh, uh, the next uh, question, uh, I think I'll go to this uh, uh, Nazri, Professor Nazri. I think in his uh, presentation, there was a mention about uh, how new technologies and solutions are used to link the play players. So does it mean that the uh, technologies uh, in the industry, you know, will grow up, will grow in leaps and bounds to uh, facilitate the, uh, or to expedite the, the use of uh, AI, for example, and um, improve or enhance the IR 4.0. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Tuaji, for the question. And that seems to be also uh, uh, reflective of some of the questions asked by uh, members of the audience. Uh, for example, how uh, digitalization will change the uh, face of uh, logistics and supply chain. And uh, obviously, the attendant question to that is, what kind of investment uh, that needs uh, in terms of uh, back office management, in terms of uh, human capital, in terms of training, retraining, skilling, reskilling, and so on. So it, it's it's a great it's a great topic to to dwell. Of course, you can, we can have uh, another webinar on that topic alone. But suffice to say that the current situation now more than ever 
uh, has uh, highlighted or underscored the importance of technology for us to leverage on to get the supply chain first and, for, uh, first and foremost to be cleared from the current clock that has been building up for the last three months, but also to do things better, to move things more swiftly, efficiently, in a more uh, time uh, uh, efficient manner, and also uh, to get products in the market safely, securely, and also within uh, in full adherence of uh, rules, regulations, and also uh, you know the current you know uh, society's mode about going green and reducing carbon footprints. So on some may already uh, be legislated. But uh, some uh, already uh, are still a work in progress. So I think we all need to look at this uh, in totality. Again, this is uh, where policies come in. Again, uh, you know, I I, I hate to to uh, to uh, uh, always uh, uh, put a sheen to, to policy, but everything uh, is done within the context of policy, national legislation. Uh, you know national framework, industry uh, regulations, aspirations, and so on. So this is where, you know, closer collaboration is needed uh, uh, between the players, uh, regulators, um, industry associations, uh, users and uh, of uh, customers or logistics services, logistics service providers, uh, and so on, in order to enhance uh, the digitalization. This is where incentives are needed. This is where, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, policy friendly uh, 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 things are, are also required in order to push gently uh, players towards uh, digitalizing because you know it would be foolish not to capitalize or leverage on things like blockchain, artificial intelligence, uh, internet of things, uh, big data analytics, virtual reality which are already being used in pockets but also being used almost uh, you know uh, nationwide in countries like China for example. You go to China people hardly even use cash anymore. Uh, what has it that even beggars now you can uh, you know can just use uh, your Alibaba Pay QR code on their smartphone to to give them money instead of uh, you know hardcore cash. So uh, this is where we can we we need to make that leap, but that leap cannot be done by the industry players themselves because uh, digitalizing uh, you know any industry is a huge task, which uh, it's a mammoth task that requires policy framework, uh, you know. Uh, even uh, even a special agency to to look into this, and this is where uh, it will be helpful for us to look into to maybe look into how logistics industry can fit into the national uh, industry 4.0 master plan, which I believe is already in place. I think the uh, the the champion agency is uh, is uh, Miti, if I'm not mistaken. Anyone from Miti here can can uh, can uh, any on this? But I do believe that uh, they were spearheading this and all the government agencies uh, that are involved uh, in, in the IT telecommunications are all uh, uh, on ball uh, with this. And this is where uh, I would have hoped that the logistics players were consulted on this. But in the absence of something specific on logistics, on digitalization, uh, it is hoped that uh, you know more engagement will, will occur later between the policymakers and, uh, and uh, with uh, industry players in order to uh, to to foster the uh, rapid uh, adoption of uh, Industry 4.0 because the rest of the world is already digitalizing. If we are slow to move, we will forever play catch up and uh, even at the detriment of our own, uh, uh, in, not only industry, but also trade and economic growth. So uh, it is hoped that uh, we use this opportunity, the quiet lull moment during uh, COVID uh, to, to really relook into all these things. And did you, whether we like it or not, again, I don't want to be uh, either a monster or a mouse about it. I mean, uh, you know, we are all living with technology. The fact that we're convening now is, is you know, it's us adopting to the new normal. So why not, uh, you know, cascade this up further to something bigger than our logistics industry and and, uh, and international trade? Because uh, for Malaysia to have a hope to become a competitive trading nation is for us to further integrate ourselves and embed ourselves in the larger global supply chain scheme of things. All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Nazri. I received a signal that uh, we are coming to the end of this uh, webinar session. So would you like to have your last uh, say in say in one minute, Prof. Yeah. Nazri? Okay. Yes. Well, they say uh, famous last words are for fools who haven't spoken enough. So, <laughs> so let this fool uh, finish off by saying, 
Uh, this is a, a great topic, very relevant. And uh, again, I want to thank everyone who's involved and also most importantly, the uh, those who have lent us uh, this uh, your ears over the last one and a half uh, hours. But we're just so unfortunate that we cannot be addressing all your questions. But uh, you know you know who we are. You can connect, uh, hook, uh, hook up uh, with us on LinkedIn. And if need be, uh, you know, you buy me te tare or coffee, please, by all means, don't stop yourself. Uh, Manaro Bao said, my office is not far from Pavilion, so uh, be, feel free to come over. But again, uh, what, what we need to uh, emphasize on is it is a change world. And uh, let us not kid ourselves the new normal. Let's not even talk about new anymore. It is no longer new. I mean, the fact that we've been all walking around like Zorro is no longer a new thing. And a lot of things which are happening in the supply chain we, are no longer new and will become normal sahaja, only normal, no more new. And as we go along, new, new, new normals will spring and mushroom from the current normal. And uh, we have to brace ourselves. It is a, a very unforgiving world out there, very ultra competitive. And uh, it is no place for the meek hearted, for the indecisive, and uh, for those who are, who are hesitant. So uh, we need to uh, get going and we need to, uh, I mean, collectively as industry players and as a nation, the time has come more than ever for us to, uh, you know, close ranks and uh, set aside differences. And there are a lot of a different, uh, uh, th there's a lot of different uh, uh, expectations and also interests even within the logistics community. What more the entire supply chain? But like I said, I mean, we are all so dependent uh, it is symbi a symbiotic process along the supply chain. We can only be good if the other people are good. So we have to bear that in mind. With that, thanks. Thank you very much. So, Professor Marco, your last word. Swanaji, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so we came to the conclusion on how COVID-19 eh, will change supply chains for good. Uh, I think it's important to realize that also what Nazari says, uh, we are in a new era, we are the era of um, information, it's good to realize that uh, we need to build new skills. Uh, so we need to learn about data analytics, we look at procurement, uh, supply chain management, and also risk management. So these are important skills that are needed uh, to be mastered. Um, don't sit on the couch watching uh, TV, I mean, during the lockdown. I think it's time also to educate yourself. Uh, Help University, we also created uh, online learning platforms uh, next to the face-to-face -face, uh, learning. In fact, we received a five-star rating uh, uh, a few weeks ago uh, for our online learning uh, solution. So I think it's uh, time to educate yourself. Uh, to be to create those new skills yeah, for the new era. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, since uh, Faiz has left uh, the, uh, this session, so again, once again, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, HAP University and MV International, as well as all participants who spend their time this morning with us. I apologize for not being able to run through all the questions, but I hope uh, we have. I managed to capture the essence of this, uh, your thought and your questions uh, with the speakers today. And of course, this is a never-ending. I, I know some of you are asking how long will, how long more to go before COVID ends. I think nobody has the answer right now, as long as uh, we don't have that uh, vaccine to to assist in the recovery process, we'll keep learning. And even now, there are a lot of uh, areas that still need to be learned. What we need to do is to just uh, keep ourselves updated or up to date with all the development in this area.